we turn our attention to the Holy Gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded by the evangelist Luke. When some were speaking about the temple, it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he. The time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. Then he said, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all of this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you, they will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of me, but not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. <laughs> By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Roman Catholics, Episcopalians, and Orthodox Christians do not have titles for their sermons or homilies. The priest may have a title for it, but the way their liturgy is done, that title is not published in a bulletin or order of worship. In most traditions such as ours, it is. A preaching professor told me last year that the title of one sermon must always be an excerpt from the scriptural passage. He said the words preached must always take people to God's word again and again to remind them of what God is trying to do. I don't always do that, but our current context is as good a time as any, I think, to fix ourselves solely on the message of Christ as it was then and as it is today. In Luke 21, Jesus is speaking vividly about chaos and destruction, and the breaking down not only of temple, but of civilization. Isaiah is talking less about the end and more about a new beginning, that God is doing a new thing. In the very first word we heard, as, as Maureen proclaimed that reading so nicely this morning, we hear the words, I am about to create. I am about to create. 
God is on the verge of something. And despite the fact that God is speaking of building a new heaven and a new earth, Isaiah doesn't actually mean heaven up there. Isaiah was talking about change and transformation here and now. The prophet Isaiah is dissatisfied with the present reality and interrupts present calamity and distress to declare that God is commander-in-chief and that God is about to create and that God is on the verge of something new. In the words of Pastor Carolyn Sharp, God speaks of ancient truth and radiant future and reassures devastated people. Speaking of devastated people, we do have some chaos in the here and now, don't we? Our chaos relates in some ways to the reality that lots of people feel devastated as of Wednesday morning, and lots of people feel elated as of Wednesday morning. That we are so divided only adds to our angst. I appreciated a quote of William Faulkner that Senator Tim Kaine employed Wednesday morning before in introducing Hillary Clinton. This is the, the quote. They killed us, but they ain't whooped us yet. They killed us, but they ain't whooped us yet. He, of course, was referring to the despair felt over their side losing. Fair enough. For me, it has to do with the path ahead for us all. With all of our angst and our divisions, regardless of how we voted. That election brought out the worst in us. And Isaiah reminds us that God is calling us to something new. Jesus predicts horrible things that will happen, things that actually have happened in every age along the way since. And he rightly says the end will not be soon. He says we will be persecuted. He says we will be deceived. And not only will we, we be deceived, but we will be deceived by people who false, falsely claim to be of God. I'm reminded of clergy on both sides of the political spectrum telling people who they should vote for as though they could speak for God's will, as though Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton are necessarily of God. Through it all, Jesus says that by your endurance you will gain your souls. By your endurance you will gain your souls. I submit that our endurance comes about not through our fear and angst, not being dragged through life kicking and screaming, but by our faith and our resolve and our Christian witness. You may remember that this passage in Luke, which we've heard this morning, where Jesus predicts this rocky road and says that by our endurance we will gain our souls, gain our lives. This comes right after the widow casts her lot with and for God. She gives all that she has. Yes, two coins, but much greater her, her faith and her resolve to Christ. Isaiah wants the people then so many thousands of years ago and the people this morning at the Oaklawn Community Church to consider that God is about to create 
something new. God is on the verge of creating a new heaven and a new earth. And he's not talking about a far off future place called heaven with pearly gates and clouds and St. Peter with a clipboard. He's talking about thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are to make this earth, our earth, our world, this reign of division and angst more and more by day resemble the reign of Christ and the kingdom of God. As Isaiah calls for the restoration of the temple, we are called to the restoration of our people and right relationship with God and neighbor, regardless of whose sign they had on their front lawn. The Reverend Timothy Schenck is an Episcopal priest. He has a, 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 an online blog entitled Clergy Confidential, Finding God in Daily Chaos. He attempts to give preachers uh, a shot in the arm or suggestions about what they might preach on. We'll see how well he, he's doing here. He wrote an article this last week entitled, Why a Trump Presidency is the Best Thing to Ever Happen to the Church. Why a Trump Presidency is the Best Thing to Ever Happen to the Church. In the interest of full disclosure, I do not believe that Father Schenck voted for President-elect Trump. And I'm not here with political commentary beyond the fact that I wish the ballot had been like those old multiple choice tests where there was a valid answer that said none of the above. I do, however, want us to gain our souls and our lives through our endurance. Father Schenck offers seven ways to react to the Trump presidency with greater Christian witness. While I doubt that he would have written this article had Secretary Clinton won the election, I love his list, and I insist that they apply regardless of who the president is. Here's the list. Reclaim our prophetic voice. Reclaim our prophetic, prophetic voice. Speak like Isaiah does. That's what that means. Reclaiming our prophetic, prophetic voice is speaking with clarity, believing, understanding that God is on the verge of something new, that God wants to do something new. The next is recognize our one Lord. We profess our faith in Christ. We don't believe in Fox News. We don't believe in MSNBC. We don't believe in Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. We believe in Jesus Christ, crucified, risen from the dead, our Lord and Savior. Stand with those on the margins. Stand with those on the margins. Never forget that Jesus came for the outcasts. Jesus came for the downtrodden. Jesus came for the people that nobody else cared about. Make sacrifices. Needs no further uh, explanation. Embrace fear and grief. If you're experiencing grief or fear about the election or anything else, embrace that. Be in touch with that. He says be a resistance movement. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what that means. I think that means don't be afraid to go against the grain, to stand up, to stand with God. Love our enemies. Short words, easy to say, hard to do. And lastly, be reconcilers. Be people who bring others together. Be a unifying force, not a divisive force. And embrace hope. We may identify with some of these more than others, and while some may require further explanation, most of them, I think, do not. Some of you uh, may be aware that another reaction to the Trump election has been the safety pin movement. 
Anybody familiar with that? Anybody heard about that? A couple of you. This started uh, as a result of the Brexit vote in Great Britain. People decided to visibly wear a safety pin. I've got a graphic on the back page of the, the bulletin. People decided to visibly wear a safety pin in solidarity with immigrants and minorities. The statement that the safety pin makes is, you are safe with me, I stand beside you. You are safe with me, I stand beside you. So people are wearing safety pins now to be in solidarity with people who feel vulnerable, particularly in view of the election, and I think this is simply fact, incendiary things that Mr. Trump said about various groups of people during the campaign. You know what I think about people wearing safety pins to show solidarity with women, with immigrants, with Mexicans, with Muslims, with African Americans, with gays, and whoever else? You know what I think about that? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Fasten your seatbelts, folks. But we should be grateful to Donald Trump if he has caused us to want to wear safety pins to protect and care for each other. But I just have one question. Weren't we supposed to be doing that all along? Weren't we supposed to be doing that all along? Long before we decided to mark ourselves with safety pins, were not our foreheads marked with the cross of Jesus Christ when we were baptized? Or were we not marked with the sign of Christ with water if we were baptized by immersion? Didn't that mark us as people that would stand with the people that no one else wants to stand with? We don't have to understand or accept gay marriage to stand in solidarity with people who feel marginalized. We don't, have to, we don't have to have an official immigration policy or understand the theological nuances to Islam to care about people who are different or feel marginalized. Isaiah isn't talking about heaven up there. He's talking about making this world more like God's world. He's talking about giving a damn, caring for people that we don't know, that we'll never know, that we don't understand, that we'll never understand, that we don't like, that we'll never like. But that's linked to our salvation. Wearing a safety pin, which is great, is not linked to your salvation. Doing what, it was the biggest bowl I could find, by the way, of water to remind us of our baptism. It's a little glass thing. <laughs> that is what's supposed to have us doing the right thing. Not wearing, and I'm not against wearing a safety pin, but we were marked with something greater, something bigger, much long ago, and a person can take a safety pin off tomorrow and decide, I don't want to wear a safety pin anymore. We can't undo our incorporation into the Christian community. It's linked to our salvation. Jesus makes clear in Matthew 25 that unless you prefer to be a goat, and I don't think anybody wants to be a goat, right? The sheep are called to love one another as self, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, yes, welcome the immigrant, and visit those who are in prison. And by prison, that means anyone who is in any kind of bondage or slavery of any kind. Be a sheep. Wear a pin, if you like. 
But don't do what you do for the sake of the kingdom because of a pin or politics or an election. Do it because you were first marked with the sign of Jesus Christ. God is about to create. God is on the verge of something new. Be a part of it, please. And by your endurance, you will gain your souls.